following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. The only means by which we can have an understanding of the spiritual concepts in this present day is with the help of the Holy Spirit. If we want to take the Holy Spirit out of the equation, we have chosen to sever the line to the spiritual. The Bible says in John 16, 8, When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So without His help, there is no way a believer can come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, let alone become a disciple of His. Let's understand more about the role of the Holy Spirit from today's sermon. This morning, I'm going to talk about part two of having the spiritual anatomy or a spiritual understanding is the understanding of the Holy Spirit. It's a very interesting sermon. I probably will say again, that's probably this is one of the most important sermon. All right? So, but there's so many factors that are there in the Bible. A little go, a girl wrote a letter to God and she said, Dear God, in the Bible times, did they really talk that fancy? And this was a little Jennifer writing a letter to God and she said, In the Bible times, did they really talk that fancy? Many of us, when we read the scriptures, we still feel the same way, don't we? We read the parts and say, okay, Lord, what is this all about? But we still continue reading anyway. Sometimes when people say, I read my Bible in one year, I say, great, how much of it did you understand? Right? That's the most important part. We need to understand what we read. And my friends, God is not a fanciful God. There is a great element of truth that we need to understand. There are, there are things that I've been stressing a lot. It's, there are things in the natural that we see with our eyes which are not important. Things in the supernatural. What is supernatural is when God, um, uh, in lack of a better term, if he violates the nature and does something supranature or beyond the natural, or if he breaks something called the law of gravity, it becomes a supernatural event. If our blind eyes become open, that's a supernatural thing. But there's another element called spiritual, which is the most mystical and foggy and all that things I was talking about, which is the difficult thing for a, for a Christian to understand. If you read the Bible during the time of Christ or uh, the, the whole New Testament talks about this, 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, So we fix our eyes on, uh, on not what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. This is the hardest thing for us to believe, because we are living in a rationalistic society. We want an explanation for everything, and we see something, and we want to believe it. But Bible says, you got to walk without seeing. you got to believe without seeing. And Bible says, the unseen is the eternal. If I want to store up something somewhere, it's in the eternal. And in order to do that, I got to walk in an unseen path. And that's what the Bible recommends. You know, and um, we need to have an open mind. We need to have an open understanding as to, Lord, okay, I'm going to uh, close my eyes to the, to the physicality or the natural stuff. And I want to understand the things of the spirit. Many times when Christ came onto the, uh, during this time on, uh, of Christ's life on earth, there's some of the things that we don't understand. For example, Bible says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Right? We read that scripture. He says, wait a minute. Here is Jesus Christ who came to become, his ultimate intention is to become the king. He, does, he wanted to rule and reign and he wanted to be the Lord over the lives of the people. But Bible says, Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into the mountain by himself. Isn't that an interesting passage? Why did Christ get away from the people when they wanted to make him king? The reason why Christ did that is because many times when he tries to escape a situation, the reason why he did that, he wanted people to have an understanding in the spiritual, not the natural. They wanted, he wanted the people to realize that he's the king 
through the spiritual eyes. Sometimes he asks the disciples, who do you think I am? Some says, you're a prophet, some you're this or that, or you're, you know, and they had different opinions, but Peter said, you're Christ, the son of the living God. And believe me, Christ was very happy because he says, you don't know about these things, Peter, unless the Father reveals it to you. So he wants people to see in the spiritual, in the unseen, in the mystical, he wants us to recognize him, not by sight, but by faith, that he is the eternal king, and that he is the one true God. So this is the most important stuff, my friends. And uh, when Christ was living, he was walking around, uh, talking to the disciples, talking to the people. He, told, he talked mostly in parables. He told stories about various things, and he had narrators. Why did he talk about uh, the things pertaining God in parables? The reason why he did that is in order to explain the spiritual, which is such a mystery, he had to use the human vocabulary to explain the mysteries and the depths that are there in God's kingdom, that are there in God's sight, and that are there that are unseen, in the unseen world. So Christ, many times, he expressed himself that way through these parables and narratives to give an understanding to the common man as to what the spiritual elements are. But great Christ lived, uh, did ministry for three and a half years, and he died, and he rose again and went to heaven. But today, there is a problem. What if Christ lived on forever, uh, st still living and having his headquarters in Jerusalem or something? We could have had a, a broadcast like CNN or something to, for him to explain the spiritual concepts constantly because Christ is gone now. Who will explain the spiritual concepts, right? That's a major problem. We got to probably make an annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem or something if Christ was alive. I mean, we, we would learn some lessons. But Christ had a greater plan. He had a greater plan in order for us to understand the spiritual elements. You know what he said? However, he said, when he, the spirit of the truth, uh, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And the uh, Bible continues to say, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. What is Christ saying? If he was living on this planet, we wouldn't have a complete grasp. Probably we'd have a hard time getting his appointment to get to know him or get to know the spiritual elements. Probably he'll have a lot of teachings and stuff. But Christ said, here is a better solution. I'll send you somebody, the Holy Spirit, who will indwell you within you. He'll be like a personal tutor to explain the great mystical spiritual truths. And he said, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. So, okay, in order to do that, what is the plan of action? He tells the disciples, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father, he promised, which you have heard, uh, heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in the few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In order to understand the spiritual concepts, we need to have the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? My friends, some of the churches are in a sad state. You know why? Because they associate Holy Spirit with the Charismatics or extreme Pentecostals. That's what Holy Spirit is meant for. But all this uh, so-called legalism took out the connection. One connection that we have uh, with God is uh, the Holy Spirit is the main uh, bridge between us, the Holy Spirit that Christ sent. We lost that communication. If we sever the connection with the Holy Spirit, we sever the connection to the spiritual realm itself. So that is very dangerous, and that's what is happening in many churches. And here is uh, what I was talking about last time. For a sinner to pass from death to life, you know, he hears the gospel somewhere, he gets saved, and then he gets discipled, and they're the most imp interesting thing and the most important thing for a believer's life is the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit is the one who will lead us into some truth. No, he will lead us into all truth. And how do you distinguish between a believer and an unbeliever? Bible says this, Romans 8, 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you're not led by the Spirit of God, you are not the Son of God. If you don't have the Holy Spirit within you, you are not a born-again believer. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, and without Holy Spirit, you don't know how to discern, you don't know how to make judgments, but Bible says, and Christ said, you need the Holy Spirit, because until you have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, you will not be called the sons of God. That's an important question I might ask this Sunday morning for the believers sitting here. Do you have the Holy Spirit? And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you got a question whether you're saved in the first place. 
It's a very important question. My friends, when if you have the Holy Spirit within you, you won't have to be taught, do this, do that. Bible will lead us, the scripture will lead us, the Holy Spirit will lead us through the scripture into all truth, and we need to have the Holy Spirit. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Or what is the Holy Spirit? Sometimes in the scripture you see that the Holy Spirit came like a dove. So is he a dove? Sometimes it's, it's like the wind, you know, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, it's like the wind or the fire, or, or who exactly is the Holy Spirit? In India, uh, as kids, we had a yearly annual get-togethers, just like you people get together for Thanksgiving. Uh, as, kids, we used to go to, uh, as kids, we used to go to our grandparents' house. It was a small town in my province, and all our cousins and everybody used to go to the house, uh, uh, to our grandparents' house. It's the summertime, uh, great games, 50 degrees centigrade outside, but the kids, nothing would stop them. You know, we used to play all kinds of games and everything. It was fun, and there were mangoes. Mangoes are pretty big in India. Summer, everybody eats mangoes. So we, were, we always used to have a good time. But there was one thing that really uh, used to get excited about. What was that was, right beside our grandma's house was a Pentecostal church. And the church was so close in proximity, you climb the wall, you can get down. We used to play in the church's yard too. It's, in India, churches are not, as, uh, the houses or the whatever is not as far as what it, what it is here. It's very secluded. Over there, you can walk from one building to another without a problem right, from the top, right, it's not a problem, so this Pentecostal church was right beside our grandma's house, so every Sunday, uh, we used to go to, there's a lot of Lutheran churches there, we used to go to Lutheran church with my mom, she was a very strong, she's still a strong Lutheran, my dad is a strong Baptist, right, so I had to find a peaceful place, and I got saved in a Pentecostal meeting, so I was all confused, all right, but here is the situation, so my mom used to go to the Lutheran church after we come back home, and the Pentecostal church still used to go on, it started at nine in the morning, they ended at two in the afternoon, Try that, seaside community. Nine in the morning, two in the afternoon. Right here they are all worshiping, but all of a sudden, the noise within the church would increase. All of a sudden, the people are playing, the drums would play faster, and there was like a huge roar, and people are screaming and clapping and everything, and all of my cousins looked at one another, we used to say, the spirit came. The spirit came. So all of a sudden, all of our cousins, we used to run to the church doors and see what's going on. And all these people who are clapping away, some people are rolling, and, and we used to look, hey, the spirit came. Look at that. So it was a mo every Sunday, this used to be our excitement. This used to be an adventure for us to run to the church, see whether the spirit came or not. You know, did the spirit come? Yeah, he came to. He didn't come today because the drums were not faster or the people were not clapping faster. So we were so, I was looking at all this as a kid. I had didn't have any understanding, but I thought, I didn't even know that was a kind of Christianity too, but I used to watch that as it was a good entertainment, by the way, some were faking it pretty good, but it was a good entertainment for me. I never questioned what this Holy Spirit is all about. We used to say, Atma Chindi, which means the Spirit came, and that's what I knew, the Spirit came, right? That's all I knew as growing up. So finally, when I got saved, it's the experience of the Holy Spirit that really transformed me, of course, but who is the Holy Spirit? So the Bible says he's one of the Trinity. If you look at this picture here, the Spirit, Holy Spirit is God, Son is God, the Father is God, but they're not one another. It's, a, uh, it's one of the most difficult concepts to explain in the scripture, but Holy Spirit is not, it's, he's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same. The Trinity, the, both, uh, the three of them have equal importance, and it's very important to understand. The word that was used in the Bible in the original Hebrew is called ruach, which means breath of God, the Spirit. In the Greek, it's called pneuma, which means the breath. The Spirit is the breath of God. So let's look at a little bit of history and how did the Holy Spirit uh, exist uh, in human terms, uh, in a human uh, timeline? How do you explain this? There are two phases that you can divide the coming of the Holy Spirit. Number one, from creation to the death and resurrection of Christ is called before the Spirit was poured out and after the death and resurrection of Christ is where after the Spirit was poured out. So what is the functionality of the Holy Spirit? Number one, Primarily, the Holy Spirit exists to convict. John 16, 8 says, when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, Christ says, he will convict the world regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. There are three things, the primary responsibility of the Holy Spirit, one of the Trinity, one of uh, uh, the Godhead, his primary responsibility is convict the world of sin, 
righteousness, and judgment. Did it change in the New Testament or was it the same in the Old Testament? Let's look a little uh, towards history here. In Genesis 3, the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. This is in context to the flood. The spirit was convicting and striving with man to, to convict them about the sin, righteousness, and judgment, but they didn't obey. It happened in Genesis. So the functionality is still the same. In Acts, we see another, another scripture. You stiff-necked people, this is what Stephen, um, before he was stoned, he was saying, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. The Holy Spirit's functionality was the same right from Genesis even till today. So the same uh, spirit of conviction into sin, about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's see some, of, some more il- instances in the scripture. There are few people that the Holy Spirit came upon in a special way, right from Genesis 1 to Acts 1. You see, he existed even during the time of creation of the Spirit was hovering over the waters. The same Holy Spirit that is there now hovered over the waters. Interesting phenomena. But he also came upon special people, at least a few people upon whom the Holy Spirit came upon. You know, Joseph, the son of Jacob, the Holy Spirit came upon him. There's a one guy called Bezalel from the tribe of Judah. The Holy Spirit came upon him to give him the wisdom as to how to, to build some stuff in the tabernacle. There was Moses and the 70 elders. There's Balaam. There's Joshua. There's some judges in the, in, of Israel upon whom the Holy Spirit came. Othiniel, uh, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson. Samson Samson, we loved Samson, you know, he bought the whole house down. Remember that story where you push, okay. He's a, two pillars, the whole, as kids we love that story, isn't it? I love that story and the Daniel story. Maybe I got to preach a sermon someday on that. Anyway, this is such an interesting thing. Very phenomenal, right? And uh, God, the Holy Spirit came upon these people. King David, Saul, you know, and there's some other prophets all throughout the scripture. And John the Baptist, the strange man eating wild locusts and honey, right? And a strange guy. And there's uh, Mary upon whom the Holy Spirit came. And Zacharias and the 12 disciples. And Jesus himself was led by the Spirit. So Holy Spirit came upon people before Acts 1 in particular occasions. But if you look closely, he came upon principally leaders and prophets and he gave them a word to speak. God came upon these people to give a word to his people. He came to, uh, uh, came to men and they received the wisdom from God. And they received the knowledge, the power to lead the power to bear burdens, to make judgments, to comfort the children of Israel, to teach the word of God, and even sometimes the physical powers to push the two pillars. Isn't that awesome? So sometimes they even, Elijah, he outran a chariot, he tucked his cloak and he ran. The Holy Spirit came upon him and he ran. Man, I wish I knew that secret when I was participating for the Olympics. (laughs) Anyway, but anyway, I wasn't, I'm not an athlete at all. I'm sorry to disappoint you, right? But anyway, here is the situation. God came, he gave them remarkable abilities to do some extraordinary stuff. And through those acts and through the results of these, these prophets and the nation of Israel, they respected God's attributes. They respected the nature of God and great reverence and fear came upon the people. But if you look from Genesis 1 to Acts 1, the Holy Spirit came upon the people, not permanently, but only on a temporary basis for the specific task. He only came for a temporary purpose, not for a complete task. And uh, for example, um, Saul, he received the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was dwelling upon him, but the Bible says as soon as he sinned, when his sin uh, took priority, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 40, now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. So when they sinned, when they disobeyed God, the Holy Spirit left them. And when you see Psalms, you know, we sing the song, Create in me a clean heart. He says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I think that song is not in today's context. I think it, it's meant for them. Because the Holy Spirit came upon them, came upon them, but he used to go away when, when the sin was dominant. So he came upon specific instances, spe- uh, specific timelines. But God, in his marvelous plan, marvelous love, he made a promise to people. You know, he said in Joel, um, and it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Uh, your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even in the male and female servants, I will pour out the spirit in those days. God 
made a promise. This, in these uncertain times so of the Old Testament, people were struggling. It's like, what is going on here? World Spirit is coming and leaving, and they're disappointed. Sometimes they're living a stronger life. Sometimes they're worn. Sometimes they're comforted. There was different situations that were happening, but God ultimately gave a promise. I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. And what a beautiful promise. So what happens? 830 years later, approximately 830 years later, it was a day of Pentecost. They were all gathered to, these disciples all gathered in one place. Suddenly a sound of a blowing of the violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and, and came and rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. So here is a brief picture of the Holy Spirit throughout history. Now, is there a greater understanding or is there a bigger picture that we can zoom out and we can look at and try to define why exactly was the Holy Spirit given? Was this a random act? It's like, okay, I'll give my spirit and God does some act, but probably is not a word in God's dictionary, all right? He does something very specific for the right reason. So I want to explore what is the overall purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit and show you something marvelous. It all lies in the fact, in the first part of the sentence, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And that's the day that God chose to send the Holy Spirit. So what is the day of Pentecost? We studied a little bit during the Feast of Israel, but I'm gonna show you some more, a little more about what exactly happened. The Feast of Pentecost occurs on the 6th of Sivan, which is the Jewish calendar, it's around May and June, I think, according to uh, our English calendar. It occurs on the 6th of Sivan, and the Feast of Pentecost happens 50 days after the Feast of the First Fruits. The word penti means 50. Penti means 50, man, rhymes. All right, anyway, the word Pentecost, it's 50 days after the Feast of the First Fruits was the day of the Feast of Pentecost. This one name, there are so many names for this feast, but one name for this feast is the Feast of the Giving of the Law. The Bible says, on this very day, the 6th of Sivan, the, the day of Pentecost, God gave Israel the law, the Feast of of the giving of the law. Now, is there a link with this day of Pentecost, with the giving of the law, and the coming of the Holy Spirit? Let's try to explore that concept this morning a little bit, then we can understand a greater elements of why the Holy Spirit is here on this planet. You with me so far? Say amen. Let's become Pentecostal because of the Holy Spirit sermon, all right? Amen? amen. Good, thank you, I can hear you. Okay, let's move on. Let's have a little bit of understanding and what happened in the giving of the law. So Passover was the 14th of Nisan. You know, they had the Passover feast. It took them three days to cross the Red Sea. From there, from there to, for them to come to Mount Sinai, it was 46 days. So with all this total time of 46 days, God says, uh, one day he calls Moses, Moses, I want to do something with your people. I want, uh, with my people, I want to give them my law. I want to give them something special. Tell them to get themselves ready and gather at the foot of Mount Sinai and I'll give them something, all right? So what happened here? God gave, uh, the sixth of Sivan came exactly 50 days after they left Egypt. So here they are all gathered and God gave something called the Torah, which means the law of the Lord. The first five books of the Moses are the law of God. The original meaning of the law, you see many times in the New Testament too, the law means instruction or teaching. God gave them instructions through Moses, he talked about Aaronic priesthood, sacrificial system, tabernacle, Sabbath, festival, sermon, uh, civil and ceremonial laws, and all those things that you find very fascinating in the book of Leviticus, that stuff, all right? So God gave them so, many, so much stuff through Moses and he gave them on this particular day, on the day of Pentecost, on 6th of Sivan, he gave them the law, the Torah. But there's another bigger picture for all this, my friends. On this day, I'll make this statement and listen very carefully. God betrothed, engaged himself to the nation of Israel, which is considered to be a bride. Let me take you through a little bit of understanding of the Jewish wedding. For engagement in a Jewish custom, it occurs in two stages. The first stage is the signing of the ketubah, the contract. It's like, if you're engaged, you gotta sign a contract. 
Can you believe that, teenagers? Right? You gotta sign a contract first, all right? That the guy promises, uh, he, he makes all the uh, mutual obligations of the guy taking care of the girl, so he has to write down all those things in this ketuba, in this contract. That's the first stage of engagement. And then actually, the wedding process happens later on, right? So this is a whole phenomenon that is there. It happens in two stages, but the most important thing is the contract is drawn during the time of betrothal itself. So what happened here? Here is the third month of Israel. All the Jews, all the nation of Israel were standing. This is the real footage of the, uh, the foot of uh, Abel Jalwaz, you know, and uh, they found this mountain in Saudi Arabia. On the top of the mountain you see it's like a shadow, it's not a shadow, they found it burnt on the top of the mountain. They broke the rock, it's, it's crispy on the outside because it was burnt, right? So God told Moses and the Israelis to get ready for three days, and they gathered at the foot of this mountain. What a phenomenon, can you think about it? So all the nation of Israel, they gathered, but God told them, don't come too close, because if you come closer, you're gonna die. So Moses placed, Bible says, they placed boundaries and markers around the mountain so the nation of Israel could come that far, but Moses alone was allowed to come up the mountain. And you see the stones around the mountain, they found huge piles of stone around the mountain where the nation of Israel could come. Imagine this day. They're all ready, they're cleansed, and they're prepared themselves. It was morning time. There was dense clouds. God descended upon Mount Sinai. There was thunder, lightning, and this fire and smoke. And probably uh, to imagine that grandeur, I would be shivering in the awesomeness of our God. And here is Moses climbing up the mountain. Probably he was scared. Probably he didn't know what to think. So he was climbing up. And then the voice began to speak. The God began to speak the Ten Commandments one at a time. And the rabbis say when the voice spoke through this, through this cloud, it was like as if this sound waves were traveling individually, individually and they were talking to the people. Because the Bible says it's a strange scripture and the people saw the thunder. Thunder is sound. How can you see thunder? You with me so far? You can see lightning. You can see, you know, you can hear the noise of the trumpet. But Bible says they saw the thunder. It's a strange kind of phenomena that was happening. And the people were all here. The nation of Israel is here. God is speaking. And his voice went to every individual. And they saw his voice. He's the voice. One of the titles of God is the voice of many waters. There's so much to explore regarding this. But when the voice was speaking and he was giving the commandments, he was almost signing a ketubah or a contract is being signed for betrothal. And what happens when this uh, contract was written on these tablets of stone by Moses and it was given, all the people said, we will do everything as the Lord said. What they were saying is, I do. Isn't that beautiful? So then when the contract is happening, when this engagement process is happening between God and his people, the beautiful picture of the old covenant came into existence. That's what it means when you read Old Testament. That's, this is the phenomena that, that resulted in the forming of the covenant. God betrothed himself with his people. Years passed, time went on. Even though there is a covenant that was made, Israel kept slipping away into the sin again and again. They committed religious prostitution. The first commandment, you shall have no other God beside me. They kept breaking that law. They kept get, getting into sin again and again and again. And ultimately, if you look at the Old Testament, you'll end up seeing nothing but unexplained ceremonies. If you don't understand the ways of God, it's just a bunch of unexplained ceremonies, unachieved purposes, unappeased longings by these poets and these writers, and unfulfilled prophecies. These people were living a prostituted life spiritually, and that disappointed God. But God, praise God, because he's not a God who's going to abandon us as we are. He's a God who fulfilled his wonderful commitment. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon my people. And the day came after Christ died and he rose again. The Holy Spirit came. It was the day of Pentecost. Uh, They were all together in one place. And suddenly, you see the elements here, the sound like the blowing of the violent wind. There was sound. Right, and they were in the heaven. The whole fill, uh, whole house, they, uh, the whole f- house was filled. They saw what seemed like tongues of fire. 
separated and came and rested each, each, in, on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Thousands of people come to Jerusalem on every feast of Pentecost. They come from all over to do, uh, to, to worship the Lord. The Jewish people and some different people uh, who uh, considered the Jewish God as their own God and they're here saturated in the city of Jerusalem. And all these disciples, 120 of them, they were all in one accord. I'm not talking about Honda Accord here. They're all in one accord in a room and they were praying. They're waiting upon the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit came. It came with a loud noise. It came with some extraordinary signs and extraordinary uh, events that took place. And probably this grasped the attention of the people walking around. What is going on in this room? And they began to speak in other tongues. The word that was used, they're speaking other known foreign languages. Without the knowledge, the Holy Spirit began to give, give them utterance. On the 6th of Sivan, the day of Pentecost, the law was written on the stone. But on the 6th of Sivan, during the time of Acts, the law was written upon the hearts of the people, just as he promised. You see this in Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant. This is what the Lord prophesied and, and made a covenant. I will make with the house of Israel in those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Instead of writing it on a stone, he wrote it on the hearts of the people on, uh, during the time of Acts when the disciples gathered together. So as a born again believer, every time we want to be saved, whenever we ask people to say, do you want to repent of your ways and everything, Bible says this is how it's done. If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I told this before, why do we need to confess with the mouth? Why, mouth? why can't we just believe, oh, I believe you as my savior, you can be just done. But why do you have to say it? Because every time you say it, you're betrothing yourself to God and saying, I do. That's why confession with the mouth is made to salvation. You see the different kind of betrothal that's happening with the Gentiles? The betrothal was a picture at Mount Sinai was a picture of what's about to happen. Every time, every time you see in the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament are complementary. You can see the answers within the scripture. You don't have to look elsewhere. So here is the betrothal that happened. And something strange happened on this very day, my friends. When the law was given, Moses came down with these 10 commandments. And the nation of Israel took too long. The nation of Israel, like, were tired. When is Moses going to come? And you know, all that frustrated. They made a, a golden calf and they began to worship an idol. So when Moses came down with these ten commandments, he was broken. He broke those commandments and he made a call. He said, who is on the Lord's side? And the few Levites came to, uh, to, with Moses. Then he took a sword. He went through the camp and they killed people. You know how many people they killed? 3,000 people were killed that day. It's Exodus 32. Go home and read this and interesting, interesting stuff. When the law came, 3,000 people died. But you know what happened when the Spirit came? The day of Pentecost when the Spirit came, Peter, the guy who betrayed and denied and everything, he stood up and he spoke a sermon. You know how many people were saved? 3,000 people were saved. What does the Bible say? 2 Corinthians 3.6. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What a beauty. When the law came, there was disappointment. But when the spirit came, there was life. That's why, my friends, there are many Christians who live a legalistic life. They're st so strict about the letter of the law that they don't even show grace anywhere. I heard this story very fascinating. A guy was looking for a church. He went to a church and he came back very angry. He said, uh, didn't you like the church? His friend asked him. And he said, no, the preacher was talking about sin, hell, repentance, judgment, and eternal condemnation. I didn't like the church. And his friend said, okay. Next week he went to try another church. And uh, he was so excited after he came back. And he told his friend, I like this new church. I said, what did the pastor preach on? He said the pastor preached on sin, judgment, condemnation, repentance, and eternal judgment. How come 
but isn't that the same church you, kind of church you've been to before? And then the only difference this time, this pastor was crying as he spoke these words. My friends, if we lose the grace of God in our lives, it doesn't matter you say how much you love somebody. You are ripping apart a person. Do not lose grace. That's something I lacked. For a few months, God kept showing me again and again, come on, you need grace. You rip apart everybody. You rip apart everything you see. That's not Christianity. The letter of the law kills, but the spirit of the law, spirit of, spirit of grace gives life. That's the spirit we need. Grace is not compromise either. Don't mistake me. Do not compromise with the truth, but do it in love. Love covers everything. So here's the a, here's a difference overall. You see, the first Pentecost, the commandments were given. In the Pentecost after Christ, the Holy Spirit was given. Fifty days after the Feast of First Fruits, I talked about the Feast of First Fruits, how it's symbolic. The very day Christ rose from the grave, the Feast of Resurrection. Law written on stone, law written on flesh. 3,000 people killed, 3,000 people received salvation. The letter kills, the Spirit gives life. Written by the finger of God, written by the Spirit of God. And Pentecost was not, nothing but a rehearsal. And God had a physical way of showing what's about to happen in a bigger picture. So this is what happened. The betrothal with Israel. This is a real historical event, my friends. Mount Sinai experience. It happened in history with Israel, and it happened with the church during the Acts of Apostles, and we are living in the church age, and praise God, the Holy Spirit still works in believers' lives, and he still changes them, and we are still being betrothed into the body of Christ, but it's all coming to an end because it will ultimately end up in a marriage when we meet the Lord in the air. And all this is accomplished with the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prepares the bride for the bridegroom. I repeat this statement again. The work of the Holy Spirit, if you look at the bigger picture, is to prepare the bride, which is us, the church, for the bridegroom, who is Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate again. I'm coming to the end. You heard the story about Abraham and Isaac. A wonderful story where Abraham is 100 years old, as good as dead, that's what the Bible says. And God promises, it's like, I'll give you a son. 100 years old, he get a beautiful little, here is a 100-year-old uh, husband, a 90-year-old wife, we are playing with a little toddler. Can you imagine that picture? Right? That's really strange, isn't it? So here is Isaac, the promised one. Probably they loved him and they cherished him so much. But one day God calls Abraham and says, Abraham, Sacrifice your son for me. Give him as a burnt offering. Imagine that. But Abraham believed God. I don't know, it was a really hard situation. He packs up, listen to this. He packs up all the gear and he sets out to Mount Moriah where Isaac was, he very intended to sacrifice Isaac. He takes a donkey along with two men and Isaac and Abraham, they all go together. Three days later, they see Mount Moriah he takes the wood, he cuts the wood and puts it on his son, Isaac. If you're looking very carefully, you see a picture of a father and a son there. Three days later, he had a certain young man, Isaac, carrying the wood up a mountain. All right? He was carrying up the uh, wood on the mountain. The son asked, Dad, uh, we have the wood, we have everything, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham says, the Lord will provide for himself a, sacri a sacrifice. A kind of prophecy being acted out right there. So Abraham was about to sacrifice. God stops him. A strange picture. And after that, we see Isaac coming back to life. is almost it's a picture of resurrection. And it's a, this very mountain, uh, close to two or 3,000 years later, another father sacrificed another son. God the Father sacrificed his son Jesus on the same mountain, Mount Moriah. That act of prophecy that uh, 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 Abraham and Isaac did. But it continues. This is a strange scripture. It says, after God brings Isaac back to life, Genesis 20 to 19 says, so Abraham returned to his young man and they arose and went together and, uh, to Beersheba and Abraham lived in Beersheba. If you read this scripture at the end of that chapter, Abraham, they came down from the mountain with the two men, probably they returned and they lived in Beersheba. My question to us is, where is Isaac? Where is Isaac in this scripture? So Abraham returned to his young man, but where is Isaac? Strangely, the next time you see Isaac is when he meets his bride called Rebekah. What do you see in this picture? God the Father 
is represented as a type. Abraham was a type of God the Father. Isaac was a type of Jesus Christ, a son who was about to be sacrificed, resurrected, but after the resurrection picture, you don't see him. The next time you see him is when he's meeting his bride, right? But how does God do it? He sends, uh, Abraham sends his servant named Eliezer to go and find a bride for his wife, for, for his son, Isaac. So Eliezer goes and finds Rebekah, you know, watering the camel stuff. So he finds a wife and he brings him back to Abraham. You know what Eliezer means in original Hebrew? It means comforter. Who is the comforter in the New Testament? The Holy Spirit. So here's the picture. Isaac, a type of Christ. Abraham, the type of God the Father. And Eliezer, the servant. Servant in biblical times means not a guy who cleans up the mess after you. Servant is the one who inherits everything that uh, the master owns if the master passes away. And from there it's distributed to the kids. So he's the next inheritor. So Eliezer was a type of servant. It's It's a representation of the Holy Spirit. So why is the Holy Spirit here on this planet? My friends, God sent the Spirit overall picture, to prepare the bride, which is this church, to meet the bridegroom, who is the son, who is Jesus Christ himself. And my question to us, how does he do it? It's through conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment, so that we can be blameless, blemishless, and upright bride standing before God. Do you allow, do you and me allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives? If that's the case, if the Holy Spirit is leading you, why do you still have some stuff in your house? Even though God convicted you, you still hang on to it anyway. Teenagers, why do you bring home the movies that are not supposed to be there? Why do you watch the stuff that God didn't intend you to watch? Do you feel the conviction? If you don't feel the conviction, here is my statement. You might be mad at me. You are not saved in the first place. If you're not led by the Spirit of God, you're not a born-again believer. If you are a born-again believer, the Spirit will give you the desire to long after the things of God, and your only desire in your life will be, pleased, will be to please your Master. And if that is not happening, I want to question your salvation. It's a, it's a sorry state of affairs, my friends. I'll be talking in a couple of weeks about true conversion and false conversion. And I want you to decide. I don't want you to end up in misery thinking that you've done great. Many who say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this, do that? God says, I never knew you. Just because somebody said, just because you're born in a garage doesn't make you a car. That's true. And my friends, I want, to serious, I want you to seriously think, do we have the understanding of the Holy Spirit? Do we still have the connection with the Lord who's leading us into all truth? Or do you desire for the, for the truth at all in your life? Christians, let's live like Christians. Let's be led by the Spirit of God. I speak it from the bottom of my heart. I've seen enough compromise. It's time to live a righteous life. Sever the parts in your body, sever the areas in your life that are hindering your walk with the Lord and let the Spirit move. He's a gentleman. The more room you give, the more he'll work. The less of you, the more of him.